Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 512. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast, a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. And for more information or to check out other shows on this wonderful network, please visit evergreenpodcast.com. I'd like to give a quick shout out first for the five-star review on Apple Podcasts by Rupert Robson. Thank you for that. Please keep them coming. So this week's interview is with my old friend, Mark Schaefer, a perennial visitor almost on my podcast. He's a globally recognized keynote speaker, educator, business consultant, and multiple time best-selling author. His blog, Grow, is perennially considered as one of the top marketing blogs in the world. And his latest book is brilliant, Belonging to the Brand, Why Community is the Last Great Marketing Strategy, which explores how three global megatrends are colliding to make community the next significant marketing priority. In this chat with Mark, we discuss these trends and the importance of building community in the right way. It's loaded with case studies and examples you've probably never heard of. We discuss the need to relinquish control, the definition of purpose, the difference between building a cult, a tribe, and a community, and a whole lot more. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com. Please consider the drop in your rating and don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show. My buddy, Mark Schaefer, always a pleasure to have you on my show. Uh, you are a profligate writer, writing uh, wonderful books that uh, never cease to provoke uh, and make us think. And in my case, I really think that your last book around community called Belonging to the Brand is straight and bloody on the nail. Fantastic. So Mark, in your own words, for anyone who doesn't know Mark W. Schaefer, who, 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 who do you, who are you? I am a teacher. <laughs> I think it gets down to that mentor. Um, I've, I've, I've blogged since, 2009. Um, I've got a podcast called The Marketing Companion that we're now in our 11th year. And um, I teach at uh, at, uh, a, a big university in the New York area called Rutgers. I consult and I'm a keynote speaker, but at, at my heart, I'm a teacher. So when I write a book, I'm teaching. <laughs> mm. When I'm blogging, I'm teaching. I, I just think I'm at a great place in my life. I've had a lot of amazing educational experiences, life experiences, professional experiences, and it's uh, it's a good time for me to send the elevator back down and and nurture people and and teach. So that's what that's what fills my heart. Love it, Mark. So this book, um, belonging to the brand, uh, why community is the lar- last great marketing strategy. I want to sort of get meta for you, with you a second because. At some level, while community might be a good marketing story, is it not also society's story? Yes. And I mean, actually, that was um, one of the things that propelled me in this direction. Um, It was, uh, I believe it was before the pandemic even, there was a, a headline in the New York Times that said, the loneliest generation. And it was talking about Gen Z. It was talking about our children and our teenagers and how there's just record numbers of cases of of loneliness and depression and isolation and even self-harm. A few weeks ago, there was a research report that came out that said 51% of young adults aged 18 to 24 have, have sought medical attention for a mental health issue, 51%. The average for all other generations, including millennials, including me and you, is 24%. So it's 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 like this big, you can't, you, you can't ignore it. So this was coming up on us long before the pandemic. The pandemic made everything worse. And of course, it's not just um, you know Gen Z. There's 
a lot of loneliness uh, in 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 baby boomers and the silent generation uh, with older people. So um, when you do a deep dive on this mentor, you recognize that community isn't something that we want. It's something that we need. The longest health study in history is still being done by Harvard University. They've studied the same cohort for 80 years. And now they're studying their children and grandchildren. And um, the leader of the study, a guy named Robert Waldinger, um, has a very famous TED talk on this on this uh, cohort and this study. And his conclusion is, I mean, they're trying to find what leads to a happy and healthy life. Is it wealth? Is it where you, is it your diet? Is it where you live? And it gets down to this, relationships. The conclusion of the study after 80 years is loneliness kills. So <clears throat> that was certainly something that drove me because there's there's something in my heart that says, okay, you know, what do we do about this? And by the way, it, like I said, it's not just Gen Z and it's not just people spending too much time on social media or, or on games. It, it's a very complex problem. It's a complex cocktail of reasons uh, that we, you know, we can get into if you like to, but just suffice to say that um, it's 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 not just one thing, but community is definitely an answer. And this is a business book. I wrote this to, I think, create an unassailable case why community is the most overlooked brand marketing strategy in the history of brand marketing strategies. But it also has the secondary benefit of connecting to people and healing people in a meaningful way. And as a marketing professional, that's something I'm excited about. Well, you've always been driven by a personal purpose, Mark. And if a marketing person isn't cognizant of your first chapter, which is entitled The Loneliest Generation, isn't cognizant of the meta situation, then they are sure shit going to do as they always do, which is fuck it up, which is take a great idea and run it down to the bottom rank <laughs> and the lowest do not common denominator. Which is exactly what is happening <laughs> in most places. <laughs> which isn't going to fix anything and certainly no. not going to fix their brand. No. Mm -mm. Well, you know, there's this, there's that pervasive saying that uh you know marketers ruin everything and uh but but some don't <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and and definitely i i think the thing that's exciting and encouraging to me is this movement with young people to acknowledge the importance of community and start with community you know i i i wrote this um this this book a few years ago called Marking Rebellion. And in that chapter, in that book, there was one chapter about belonging and community, sort of like forecasting this was going to become more important. And Marking Rebellion was a wake-up call saying, look, you know, you're marketing is is sick. Everybody's in this trench just doing the same things they've done year after year after year, trying to do a little bit better year after year after year. Meanwhile, nobody's looking up to see what really works and what the world really wants. And the case studies in that book showing new ways to connect with customers. Almost every case study in that book, Minter, is somebody under the age of 30. And 85% of startups, uh, at least tech startups, now are leading with community as their as as their major way of going going to market there was an article today i saw in a in a uh, a gen z marketing related newsletter saying that that this is the way this is the future uh i mentioned i think in my book that the the, the when i wrote the last words of the book the manuscript was done uh mckinsey came out with a major research report predicting Community is the next big thing in marketing. So the mar manuscript wasn't done because I I stuck that in there. I saw as it. a little <laughs> as a little mic drop moment. Um, 
but I, I think, I think I'm right. I mean, I think I nailed it. And um, I think it's marketing that works in this day and age, but it's also marketing that heals. So amen to that. Um, I have so many points, but one just, you know, riffing off of what you just spoke about, which is this tech communities and build, start with community. Sure, we've done the the Facebook version, which is build it and then think about how we're going to make money. The, the meta idea of fixing society, uh, maybe put aside, building community as a first thing. I don't know if the financial markets, Wall Street, the city in London, mm. get that. And if you don't allow, if you can't sort of persuade them, then you, you ain't going to get any funding. Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, um, and I, I think that's um, a major contribution of, of my book is that it looks at measurement of community in, in a new way. And I mm -hmm. think it sort of cracks the code. So there was, um, you know, uh, as I was doing my, my uh, going down the rabbit holes of research on community, uh, one of the things that is pervasive in the in the community management profession is that uh, community managers are just certain they're having a positive impact on their business. 90% of them say they are, but only 10% say they can really prove it. So there's this angst and this, this you know, wringing of hands in the professional marketing community. And it's because there, I think we're looking at it all wrong. And that's why this is a distinctive perspective of community, looking at it through the brand marketing lens. And I know this appeals to you because you've you lived in this world. So, you know, if you, you know, back in the days when you were working with luxury brands, if you signed some supermodel to be your representative and the supermodel was in your ads and it, it you know, it just created this, rich um, association with your brand and the meaning of the brand, can you calculate the ROI of that supermodel? No. Does it sell more stuff? Yes. Can you, can you attribute, can, can you possibly make the accountants happy by, you know, get, by sharpening your pencil and saying, here's the ROI of Cindy Crawford. No. So, but it works. And that's that's the difference between brand marketing and direct marketing. And everybody's looking at community as direct marketing. Let's point coins in and we get more coins out. And that keeps the accountants happy. But what I'm saying is you're missing the whole point. This is your most intense customer relationship. This is where the love is happening the advocacy. This is where collaboration, co-creation, you can get first party information, ideas, cultural relevance from your community. And it just seems unbelievable to me. This is another thing that just, it, it's just beyond belief. 70% of company communities do not report to marketing. <laughs> it's like, Come on. I mean, it's it, it, it just mind-blowing, which is why I think this is, it's staring us right in the face. It's this huge marketing opportunity and we're, and we're blowing it. So hopefully my book will make a difference. Well, funnily enough, um, that was true of the brand that I ran, uh, Redken. Yeah. So we uh, were in 40 countries. We were the number five brand at the time. And the way we worked was through community. So we had an event that we held once a year at the time. 10,000 customers paid wow. to come listen to us, sell wow. them what we do wow. for two and a half days in Las Vegas. And the, and some over 90% had already been. Mm -hmm. So something was going on there because the second largest event in the world in the hairdressing industry Two and a half thousand people, and the mm. company, in this case L'Oreal Professional, had to pay to have mm. their customers come. Wow. So 
definitely a different model. And and the way our community was built was through education. So we had another department that was the educators, uh, which would typically be filled with lots of hairdressers who are part of the trade. And that that's where the community was built. So it was untouched, unscathed by marketing's uh, paws. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of power in that, is that, um, and, and this is one of the points I make in the book, is that where, you know, it's, it's amazing to me that if you look at everything that companies are doing to try to build their brand, it might be through social media, it might be subscribing to some newsletter or something, it might be advertising or events, that they've stopped short. They've just stopped short of what is is the is the ultimate idea. And in your case, when you have a convention hall filled with, with raving fans, your marketing is over. They're the marketers. Of course they are. They're the they're the advocates. And and they're just selling stuff to each other. Uh, a, a relevant case study in, in the book is um Sephora. Sephora, they've got brick and mortar stores all over almost any significant city in the world, I would guess, has a Sephora store. And yet 80% of their sales come from an online community. They've got 6 million people in this community and they're, they're just selling to each other, right? They're trying new things, they're experimenting. And they've captured these uh, amazing fanatic people who love skincare and cosmetics and they're trying new things out and 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 they get it and by the way the number one metric in that community is engagement and now you and I have been around long enough where we've we've kind of poo-pooed engagement right i mean engagement in the social media sphere is like you know you can go break you can go broke with engagement. You can engage yourself broke. <laughs> I had a blog post that went viral one time. I spent not I spent all my time for three weeks with thousands of comments on engagement, right? Did it do anything for my business? No. <laughs> but a community and you know, engagement is vitality. Engagement shows you're relevant, you're connecting. People are talking about you. And if they're talking about you in the community, they're going to talk about you outside the community. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, it's 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 a new way to think about uh, measurement. It's a new way to think about connection. It's a new way to think about really a marketing mindset, the, that the customer is your most effective marketer. And uh, if you do it right, uh, and you have a community like Sephora does, you're not going to have to have that many sales or coupons or, you know, holiday events because you've got people in there that are that are buying your stuff and advocating for you all year round. Well, the Sephora example uh, raised my eyebrows, Mark, I must say, because um, one of my best friends works at LVMH and, and I've talked about it a fair amount. But I must say that my angle was taken or my perspective was taken basically from in-store visits where I don't see the community, mm. where I don't see a store that's really engaging or interesting. So it was yeah. very invisible to me, which makes mm. me think about the fact that we have attribution models and all that, but what is is really where it's powerful is in the dark social, in the dark messages, which are off the radar which mm -hmm. is dinner table discussions with a bunch of girls who go out to a pub and have a, yeah. a wonderful chat and share their lipsticks and such if we're in that world or sharing a on a on a messaging service which is cryptid yes. where you, that you don't get to see it you don't get and to that, measure, and you don't that's get to the invent. future that's the future right and that's one of the points i make at the end of the book is that the all these conversations are going underground even that stuff that used to be on facebook and twitter the young people coming up today, they're not there. They're not going to be there. And so we've got to sort of come to terms with, it really gets down to word of mouth marketing. It's always been word of mouth marketing, of which is very, very difficult to measure. And 
the, the future is going to be this invisible, the, the invisible hand of word of mouth marketing, because month by month and year by year, social listening platforms are becoming obsolete. You know, my community, uh, I've got a community on Discord. We have a bunch of uh, bright marketing people there trying to discern the future of marketing together. We're coming up with all these ideas. We're doing all these experiments. And we are completely invisible. No one can see what we're doing. No one can see what we're talking about. And places like Discord, that's where a lot of the young people are going today. They don't want to be um, judged. They don't want to be harassed. They want to be in these closed off digital campfires. They're blockading themselves away from, from society so that they can have these safe and vulnerable conversations. The world's best known investor and Wall Street expert Warren Buffett once said, Wall Street is the only place that people ride to in a Rolls Royce to get advice from those who take the subway. Mr. Buffett's quote is remarkably accurate, but how many people would rather receive advice from him than someone simply guessing? Welcome to Buy, Hold, Sell, your single source for Wall Street knowledge and profitable guidance. Please join me, Todd Schoenberger, and fellow trader Tobin Smith, as well as host Veronica Dudo, for a podcast known to move the needle for investors. Tobin and I are seasoned Wall Street executives with deep investment experience, and we are prepared to share our advice to those who choose to listen. Download Buy, Hold, Sell today on the Evergreen Podcast Network or your favorite podcast channel. Well, I can't help but reconnect with the original proposition about the loneliest generation. Because if these kids are in these dark socials, they clearly aren't happy in those, or 51% of them aren't in a good place mm -hmm. in this dark world. Mm -hmm. and, and when you, one of your my favorite sentences in the entire book, which you you whimsically say is the weirdest sentence you've ever written. And I have to find it. It says something along the lines of, uh, the, 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 it, it shouldn't be the brand voice. You say that the brand community should not necessarily be in line with your oh, right. brand voice. And, yeah. and, and my take on that is that mostly, A, brands don't actually know their brand voice. Mm, mm, mm. They, they they put it down to like a marketing agency's version of it, but the employees don't incarnate it. The people who are typing out the social messages are wearing, quote unquote, a corporate tie and, mm -hmm. and aren't really in phase with what's mm -hmm. going on. And their brand, brand voice is all about buy me, sell me in mm -hmm. general, and not enough in this sort of meta purpose, a real purpose, which is uh, the, the thing that engages the real conversation. Yeah. Let me build on that a little bit. So, I mean, I started following this trend about six years ago. There was an article in Ad Age magazine where the CMO of Pepsi said that the brand bonfires are over, that that, that a brand voice today is about aligning, is, is, is to be relevant in cultural moments. I thought, that's really interesting. What does that look like? Well, now we're seeing that. It's exactly as you say. It's exactly as you say. It's about getting people excited about your brand in in, in relevant ways, in cultural moments. And um, so let me give you an experience from my own community. So when I started my community, you can set up these little chat rooms. I thought, well, people are interested in me and my brand. Obviously, they're going to be interested in personal branding and writing books and giving speeches because that's what I do. So I set up these little chat rooms and now we are, here we are maybe two years on in our community. And those are the emptiest rooms in the place because the community said, look, if we're going to talk about being relevant in this world, we need to be talking about the metaverse, web three, artificial intelligence, chat GPT, all these things. And they took me a whole new direction. But it's the right direction. Every article I write, every speech I give, somehow references something I've learned in this community. 
there's hundreds of people from all over the world seeing things, experiencing things I can't see. They're teaching me. They're helping me be more relevant. Now think of the power of scaling that on a brand. And this and and what is a brand? A brand is a is a continuous journey of relevance. How are we relevant to this generation right now in this moment right now? And and a community will help you do that. They're going to take you on that journey of relevance with them. So it, it's about I think you're hinting at this in your com- comment is um, the, the the brand voice is evolving. The brand voice maybe is no longer what the company is saying. It's what people are saying to each other. And by having community, we get to tap into that power. I think it's the most magnificent thing about community. Yeah, I think that's something, or uh, I believe – when you reference Evelyn Starr's definition of brand, it's sort of what they say about you, or mm-hmm. what you say about you. Uh, mm-hmm. it, although you always need to be able to produce, you have to have yeah. the initiate initiation, like you said about. Um, there's one of the people, one of the cases you you mentioned. You need to let go. You need to relinquish control. Yet mm-hmm. you need to give the vision, and and that's a very dodgy spot to be in the relinquishing of control, because I think a lot of people get into corporate places because it's about being in control. It's about the title on my business card and it allows me to be. And if I let go of that, that's an existential request. There's, you know, there's a profound discussion in the book. There's a a man in the book uh, in the London area and he had a B2B agency and he started this community and the community has now become bigger than his business. So we talk in the book about community-based marketing, but there are also examples in the book where the community becomes the business. He's making more money off the community than his business. And there's a profound statement in there about how humbling it is as a leader because to be successful in a community it's, it's so much different than what they taught you at the university. And this is something I'm, I'm learning every day. I'm, let me give you an example from just this week. Uh, we had a very, very vibrant um, discussion about the relevance of Web3 and the tokenized economies in my community. And, and I'm sort of like, there's, there's yes, there is a business case, there is. But there's also a lot of woo-woo pixie dust stuff that it's just not relevant to people. It, it's just there's, there's just not a strong business case to a lot of the stuff that, that 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 they're advocating. So I sort of took a position that this is sort of woo-woo. And I stepped back and I thought, am I succeeding as a leader? Because my role as the leader in this community is to create a safe, welcome, and nurturing environment, a validating environment. And as the leader of the community, sort of the papa bear, if I like disagree with people or correct people, am I stepping across a line? <laughs> I mean, it's confusing. It's one right. of the things I'm learning. It's one of the things I need to evolve in that direction as a leader and and be mindful of that. So it is very, very different than being a leader, uh, a leader in in a company. I mean, my greatest role in the community is to make it safe. Is it because it, people want to be acknowledged? They want to be validated. They want to be heard. That's why they're going to keep showing up in a community. And if I, even if I'm enthusiastic, and even if I'm passionate. If I'm shutting people down, that may not be good for the community long term. So that's one of the things I'm working through. One of the things I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm trying to evolve into a, a better, a better community professional. Well, let me let's open that one up because as I read your book and I've obviously had some experience in this notion of community, I wanted to put three words, uh, put them, juxtapose them. 
and and think of this thing of inclusion that with the safe idea that you have that underpins the inclusion mm. component mm. the three words are community mm -hmm. tribe and cult mm. and you talk about not wanting to be a cult yes except there are a lot of communities that are built around cults uh you know musical cults sure where you've got godlike figures on stage yes. you've got tony robbins yes. who has created quite the community i should say mm -hmm. around a a cult like figure that is his mm -hmm. and then you have tribes mm -hmm. tribalism yeah who poo pooed in many circles as being exclusive riff well this is a very keen point thank you for bringing this up so let me let me talk about those three terms in context i so so when most people talk about a tribe when seth godin talks about a tribe in his book tribes it's really an audience. So it's not a community. An audience is 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 one way. It, it's it, the people don't know each other. It might be a cult of personality. And it's not bad. Uh Seth's book is not bad. You know, I have an audience, you have an audience, the people who 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 read your content who listen to your show those are the ones that support you and love you and they're gonna buy the next thing you come out with so an audience is is great now it, it can also be a cult of personality it, it, this you know I, I don't think i'm as extreme as as someone like tony robbins but um there in my audience there is definitely a parasocial relationship. I'll give you an example. I got an email from a woman today. She said, I've listened to every episode of your podcast. I listened to your audiobooks. She said, I I think even though I haven't met you, uh, I think you're part of my family. All right. That is a parasocial relationship. A community is something more because that's when they know each other. And it creates this emotional switching cost to the brand. If my if I go away, then my podcast goes away and the audience goes away. But a community sustains itself with the connections between each other. My role is to fade into the community to eventually be a community member. That is real. That's really what I want to do more than anything. <laughs> I just want to be part of the community. I probably will never really achieve that. But over time, I, I, you know, the community truly is taking over. We just, um, the community, uh, my community just started a podcast. They had an idea and uh, they said, we think we've so many smart people in this, in this community. We want to create our own podcast. I said, go ahead. I have zero zero involvement in the podcast zero they've got three people running it they've got three people recording it other people are helping and you know i think they're planning maybe in in june that they'll make this thing public um but the community is taking over the leadership that's a very powerful example and that is beautiful that shows that it's vibrant that it's engaged that those that communion between people is taking place, which makes the community the long-term success. So that's, I think, the difference between, you know, cult is 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 dogmatic. Um, and it's 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 you know leader focused. Tribe is an audience, which is okay. Um, but it's not self-sustaining. A community is 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 self-sustaining. The people are there for the for each other more than the cultish leader of an of an audience. So in the musical world, I was just uh, flipping through my mind as I was listening to you. Mm -hmm. There's an example of a band where the band uh, dies, but the 
the community continues to live on. Oh my. Right. Mm -hmm. And and the Grateful Dead is is a perfect. He's, they haven't all died sure. yet, but they are close. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And and they're doing their last tour and such. But yeah. there are all sorts of other than other bands that are are like the Grateful Dead that aspire to have that same kind of feel and reproducing yeah. it. The other day, I went to see a copy band of Fleetwood Mac called Fleeting Wood Mac from Portsmouth, mm -hmm. uh, Southwest England. And uh, what was lovely about them was that they didn't try to be like Fleetwood Mac. They were yeah. their own version of Fleet Fleetwood Mac, mm -hmm. and but they were in the spirit thereof. Yeah. Yet, as you say, I think it's Dana uh, who yeah. has this great example in the book. Mm -hmm. She says you kind of still need to have the vision. And in yes, my role, sure. when I sure. when I when I ran Redken. Mm -hmm. You still had to make some pretty darn hard choices. You needed to in, you had to innovate. You had to bring stuff to the market. You had to say no to stuff because you can't do everything for everybody. And that takes decision-making executive power. So if it's within an anonymous amorphous group that all believes together, mm -hmm. the risk is that there isn't somebody who cuts through with that vision, with the, mm -hmm the strategic element of it. Yes. I, I think that's a, yeah, I, I think that's, you're exactly right. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up that point. Um, you know, for, for me, um, you know, the strategic vision of my community, and that is part of the culture is that we are here to help each other, support each other, to be relevant in a rapidly changing marketing world. That's why we're here. And, and I'll give you an example of, of how I have the vision to nurture this. So someone wanted to join my group and he was, he said, well, I have this startup and I'm desperate for more sales leads. And I said, you, you won't be happy here. <laughs> you won't be happy here because number smell one, a rat. <laughs> yeah. Number one, I'm not going to let you do that. And number two, even if you just want to, you know, be humble and and learn about driving sales leads. That's not what's happening here. So you, you're not going to fit because it's not part of the vision. The culture is kindness. It's it's zero tolerance for toxicity. Um, you know, our rule is you you talk to people like you would talk to your mother, and and I will tolerate nothing nothing that 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 is disrespectful. Uh, or dismissive to any any person in the community, and so that's the culture, and um, re, you know respect, kindness, generosity, but the vision is this is why we're here, and if you have a different vision, that's awesome, go start your own community, that's valid. Yeah, I think there there does need to be this you're not part of it element and and uh and i think that's absolutely mm -hmm. fine because if yeah. it's too inclusive back to the yeah. cult tribe and community discussion mm -hmm. then it ends up being nothing because you can't be everything to everybody and you mm -hmm. do need to stand up for stuff and be the 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 line drawer somehow and which brings me to the last zone really which is when i if you're running a company you read the book what would be the the biggest mistake that you look at when you're talking to people who are in marketing my feeling is that it's that they think they have purpose because you said it all begins with purpose mm -hmm. they think they have purpose but they don't know what they're talking about yeah yeah oh you know gosh you're exactly right mentor and um it's it's so hard for businesses and brands to, to think that way, but truly, truly, you have to put the the needs and dreams and wishes of the of the customers first. There has to be a reason to gather. And if you can't find that intersection of why you exist and what you're trying to achieve as a brand, and the and the dreams and ideas and purpose and beliefs and values of your customers, then there's really not a good business case for community. You know, um, one of the things I'm proud of in the book is I introduce many many new 
case studies. Definitely. And there's nonprofit and big companies and small companies and B2B and B2C. But, you know, I think it would be helpful for your your fans to, to uh, you know, an example that they may be familiar with is, is Patagonia. So when I talk about Patagonia, it's just so clear in your mind that this is a company that stands for sustainability and and environmental responsibility and responsible outdoor recreation that anything they do or say, you know, you believe it. It's internalized. I have a friend who he only buys Patagonia and he, he, he just says, I believe in them so much. And Patagonia is not cheap. They may not even be the most innovative, but they share this purpose. They have an intersection of purpose. And that is the soul of community. And that's where it must start. And it, it may evolve. I mean, it's going to morph and take little twists and turns because again, you're on a continuous journey of relevance. But, you know, there's got to be that intersection between what you like, you, you have to have this conversation, an internal conversation. What do we want to do for this world? What's the impact we want to have on this world? And how can we be bigger if our customers come alongside us to help us? That is a wonderful view of the of the potential power of community. Well, and that is exactly something that I am trying to promote. You, you, you actually use the two words together in the book at one point, meaningful conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's at the heart of that. And I think it is. most companies have this failure that unlike Patagonia, which where the, the boss actually lives, breathes, Srinach, he is, you know, the very embodiment of his thought. Mm -hmm. And and one of the biggest mistakes large corporations do when they invite the idea of influencers or or this notion of community is that the employees or the people working for the company don't actually live it. There's a, there's a dis, there's a disconnect. They might, you know, kind of live it. But you know that's that's over there. That's when mm -hmm. we go to the tent where all the crazies hang out. When I go back into the office, I have to be office person. Mm -hmm. And coming back to purpose, brand voice, mm -hmm. and and that integrity, where mm -hmm. you mentioned that dis disconnect between the, what what is the community and what is our brand. I think this is where that's that's a big opportunity. You know, and you know, mentor, I'll tell you, you you're just such a wonderful interviewer, and. You're helping me connect dots really through your through your questions. I love that. And one of the things, I mean, this is something you and I Thank have you. talked about before. You know, we've talked about this very idea before about your your employees as brand ambassadors. So I was I recently had a conversation with a, a former C level executive with uh he was with uh Hewlett Packard. And uh he told me that the biggest um problem especially in tech right now is is drain that there's a lot of people that they see that they have this opportunity to, to create their own thing their dream is to create their own thing and he said mark the the power of your book is that this is exactly what internal companies need if employees don't feel like they belong to the brand the, that's that's the only thing that can stem this drain. That's it. That's the only thing. If if they don't if they don't have a stake in the vision and the culture of the company through community, then you're going to continue to have this this brain drain away from these you know these important companies. And it's you know it's, it's most apparent with tech, but it's really with any company today. And I, I I hinted at that in my new book, and said this is a thing, but I, I can't the I, I the book would just be too gigantic <laughs> for me to go into that too. There's a lot of overlap. There truly is, but I'll leave that for you. That can be in the next book that you write because I know you're passionate about this idea as well as about you know really connecting to your employees in a meaningful way. And 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 uh, you know the culture 
that that leads to advocacy with your employees. Well, totally. And and you mentioned the sticker test, which mm-hmm. uh, I I tend to use the brand tattoo test, which yeah. is one step beyond. Yes. And uh, and you know, like for for me with Redkin, it was really fundamental for me. And the other day, I was uh, chatting in line, the social media that's most popular in Japan, with the uh, maybe ten old Redkin employees. Redkin doesn't even exist in Japan. Mm. And and yet, twenty plus years on, I've left L'Oreal fourteen years ago. They left Redkin. God, when we went to close it down, and yet we're still hanging out, and it's called the Redkin Group. Wow, wow, that is a community, and yet, it of course, is. Redkin doesn't really know it anymore because mm. it's part of L'Oreal and they're corporate. So we're dark, but that mm. is it. Mark, beautiful. Thank you so much for coming on. Always great to chat with you. I oh, love these. Wow. It's very, what a very treat. stimulating. What a so, treat. Mark, thank you so much. Uh, Give us, give us uh, the the riff on where to go and find out. Get get your book. Follow you. Track you down. What's up? So easy, so easy. Don't even have to remember this dude's name. If you can remember, businessesgrow.com. You can find uh, my blog, my podcast, my, uh, my, the you know the books we talked about today. We mentioned Marketing Rebellion. We we talked primarily about belonging to the brand. And uh, you can find all my books, my social connections. All you have to do is remember businessesgrow.com. And thank you so much, Minter. It's just been an absolute delight. Thanks for having listened to this episode of the Minter Dialogue podcast. If you like the show, would like to support me, please consider a donation on patreon.com forward slash Minter Dial. You can also subscribe on your favorite podcast service. And as ever, Rating and reviews are the real currency for podcasts. You'll find the show notes with over 2,000 or more blog posts on MinterDial.com. Check out my documentary film and four books, including my last one, You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man.
I don't kill anybody and I'm not a thug, but you know, it just always stuck with me. So when I have my skates on, that's my identity is kill a thug. I love it. <laughs> Interesting. Jim's roller derby name <laughs> is light banter. Yes. That's very threatening. It I is. wouldn't want to go head to head with you. You should no. see yeah. him skate in circles around <laughs> the other girls. Ever want to learn how to write a hit song or stop procrastinating or even use Brazilian jiu-jitsu in life? Thoughts That Rock is the how-to podcast that delivers the juice. 